three employees at a Starbucks coffee store in Georgetown were found brutally killed, shot execution style, sending shockwaves through the city with rumors of a possible connection to the Monica Lewinsky Bill Clinton sex scandal. Mary Catron Mahoney was born on July 22, 1972, to Mary and Patrick Mahoney in Baltimore, Maryland. She was known by her friends and family as Katie. Mahoney attended the McDonough School in Owen Mills, Maryland, graduating in 1991. She went on to study at Ithaca College for a year and then transferred to Fordham University. During this time, Mahoney became active in politics, especially relating to women's rights issues and feminism. She worked on Bill Clinton's 1992 presidential campaign and then landed a White House internship in the spring of 1993. Mary Mahoney worked in the public liaison office of the White House under Deputy Director Doris Matsui. After her internship, Mary Mahoney transferred to Towson University near her family's home in Baltimore. She studied there for two more years before graduating with a degree in women's studies in 1995. Mahoney then moved to Washington, D.C. and began working at a Starbucks in Georgetown, about two miles from the White House. She excelled at her job and enjoyed her work, and as a result she was promoted to assistant manager in May of 1997. Around this time, a scandal was brewing at the White House. On May 27, the Supreme Court ruled in the civil case of Paula Jones v. President Bill Clinton. Jones had previously sued Clinton for sexual harassment that allegedly occurred during his time as governor of Arkansas. The president's defense argued that he could not be sued in federal court while he was the sitting president, and the Supreme Court denied this argument in a landmark ruling, allowing the lawsuit to proceed. Paula Jones's lawyers wanted to show a pattern of sexual misconduct on the part of Bill Clinton, so they began issuing subpoenas to other women they suspected of having sexual encounters with Clinton. On July 4th, the Drudge Report leaked information of an investigation by Newsweek into the allegations of another yet-to-be-named accuser of Clinton. It was later revealed that this accuser was Kathleen Willey. That same day, former White House intern Monica Lewinsky had an in-person meeting with President Clinton in the Oval Office. The President was attempting to put an end to his then-secret love affair with Lewinsky which had begun in November of 1995. In the meeting that morning, they discussed a letter she had written him the previous day, threatening to reveal the affair to her parents if he did not help her land a job. He told her, it's illegal to threaten the president, and she became emotional. President Clinton tried to reassure her and implied that he still cared for her. Two days later, former Clinton White House intern Mary Mahoney reported to her closing shift as assistant manager of the Starbucks coffee shop, two miles from the White House. This Starbucks location was reportedly patronized by many in the White House inner circle, including Chelsea Clinton, George Stephanopoulos, and Monica Lewinsky. Mahoney and her two colleagues closed the shop at 8 p.m., locked the doors, and began their nightly cleanup routine. When the opening shift leader arrived the next morning, she noticed Mahoney's car still in the parking lot with a flat tire. She also noticed the music and lights were still on in the store, and the cleaning was incomplete. When she got to the back room, she found the lifeless bodies of her three colleagues, Mary Mahoney, Emery Evans, and Aaron Goodrich. By dawn, the DC Metropolitan Police had sealed the shop and began to process the scene. The victims had apparently been caught in the middle of their cleanup routine sometime after closing at 8 p.m. Katie Mahoney, who sustained most of the gunfire, was apparently still holding her keys when she fell. News of these murders came as a shock to the Georgetown community, an area where violent crime was rare at the time. DC Councilman Jack Evans told reporters, to have a triple murder anywhere is unusual, even in DC, but in Georgetown, we've never had one before. Georgetown has not even had a homicide in a year and a half. From the very beginning, there were certain facts about the case that baffled investigators. Detectives spoke to one witness who stopped by the shop at about 9.15 the previous evening. He saw the two male employees inside cleaning. 
but the door was locked, so he left, assuming it was closed. Then at 9.30, we had actually two groups of people independently walk up to the front door. The door was unlocked. They walked right on in. They looked around. They could see that the store was in the process of being cleaned up, but there was nobody there. So they figured that people were in the back, and they left at that time. So we figured, based on that sort of information, that the murders occurred between 9.15 and 9.30. This testimony establishes the timeline of the murders as taking place after the store was closed and the doors had been locked. The next day, investigators returned to the coffee shop to search for more clues. They noted the store had no security cameras and its alarm had not been breached the night of the crime. The front lock functioned properly and showed no signs of tampering. There were no reports of witnesses hearing gunshots in the crowded metropolitan neighborhood despite multiple witnesses being in the area immediately before and after the murders. Police found that no money had been taken from the store, and the safe containing over $10,000 was left untouched. Mary Mahoney had been shot five times, Evans three times, and Goodrich once. Detectives' original theory was that Mahoney was the target and that the killing was personal. When I first learned of how the bodies were positioned and the number of shots that had been inflicted on Katie, uh, one, of the th one of the initial theories was, was it was a domestic, that she had had a fight with a boyfriend, an ex-boyfriend, and, and he exploded, shot her multiple times, and then shot them as they tried to come to her assistance. Police interviewed a former Starbucks employee who Mary Mahoney had recently fired for stealing from the store, but his alibi apparently checked out and they eliminated him as a suspect. It was then that lead detective Jim Trainum called on the assistance of FBI Special Agent Brad Garrett. The two continued to follow up on leads offered through their tip line, with Starbucks offering a $100,000 reward for information about the case. On September 27th, detectives received an anonymous call from someone who said that two men were involved with the shooting and that one was named Carl. The caller gave a description of Carl, told the police where he lived, and the type of car he drove. The caller also implicated Carl in several other robberies and a possible homicide. Trainum and his colleagues at the DC police followed up on the lead, finding a man who matched the description, named Carl Derrick Cooper. A criminal background check revealed that 28-year-old Carl Cooper had a record of commercial armed robbery and suspected murder. His criminal record, coupled with the anonymous caller's statement, made Carl Cooper the prime suspect in the coffee shop triple homicide. Investigators needed to find out more about Cooper. Special Agent Brad Garrett secured a warrant to establish a trap and trace on Cooper's home phone. On September 29th, the Baltimore Sun reported that there had been a lawsuit against Mary Mahoney, apparently involving her former roommates. Police never questioned the roommates, and one officer told the son, what does getting sued have to do with getting murdered? What the police weren't yet telling the media was that their main focus was now Carl Cooper. Police began tracking and surveilling Cooper and putting pressure on those connected to him personally. This led them to Cooper's possible accomplice, a barber named Ernest Burwell. They decided to track Burwell's phone calls. Investigators needed to somehow confirm if the barber had been involved in the coffee shop killings. They hoped a trap and trace on his phone would tell them more. At this point, we're just trying to figure out who this guy is in the barber shop and what is his relationship with Carl and had he committed robberies with Carl. So we did a background on him. He had served time for armed robbery. And based on what sources were telling us, that the two of them, along with other individuals, had committed armed robberies. Meanwhile, Detective Tony Patterson was following up on another lead in the case. A former drug addict named Eric Butera told the police he had overheard people talking about the Starbucks killing in a crack house. In December 1997, DC police sent Eric Butera back to the house to make a drug buy so they could obtain a search warrant. Butera was turned away at the crack house and then jumped by three men who beat him to death. Butera's family was later awarded $1.1 million in a civil case against the DC police. In late January 1998, the president's affair with Monica Lewinsky became public, 
and the Capitol was abuzz with news of a major scandal at the White House. But I want to say one thing to the American people. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. I never told anybody to lie, not a single time, never. These allegations are false, and I need to go back to work for the American people. Thank you. By February, DC police were still investigating Carl Cooper, but could not yet tie him to the Starbucks murders. Detective Trainum and his colleagues were gathering information from the girlfriend of Carl Cooper's former accomplice. He had been murdered in 1993, and Cooper was the prime suspect. Throughout that year, police followed more leads on people who indicated Cooper had something to do with the Starbucks case. In August, a detective from Prince George's County called them with information about other possible crimes Cooper and Burwell had committed. Sergeant Joseph McCann was investigating yes, Cooper for the attempted also, murder of a police officer. Jim, Joe McCann, how are you? The sergeant was working with a female informant who also wanted to tell the FBI what she knew about Cooper. The informant and Mr. Cooper had uh, committed several armed robberies together, which is the reason why the informant was in jail for armed robbery at the time. So uh, she knew him very well. Place, I was the getaway driver. There's two other. She described several robberies involving Derek Cooper and Ernest Burwell, with Cooper as the leader and organizer. From this information, the FBI began developing a racketeering case against Cooper and used this to gain a warrant to wiretap his phone and pager. Meanwhile, Lewinsky and Clinton had testified before a grand jury. President Clinton went on TV on August 17th and admitted to the relationship. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. In fact, it was wrong. It constituted a critical lapse in judgment and a personal failure on my part for which I am solely and completely responsible. But I told the grand jury today, and I say to you now, that at no time did I ask anyone to lie, to hide or destroy evidence, or to take any other unlawful action. In November of 1998, secretly recorded audio of Monica Lewinsky speaking to Linda Tripp about the affair was released to the media. In a recording made in January 1998, Lewinsky told Tripp she feared for her life. Are you bound and determined to do what you plan to do? Absolutely. Okay. I, you, are you, are you positive in your heart that you want to do that? I mean, that's the only thing I'm just saying that in case you should change your mind. No, no, I, 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 first of all, for fear of my life, I yeah. would not, for fear of my life, I would not, I would not cross the state people for fear of my life. Number one. Journalist Joseph Farah further claimed that Lewinsky told the source she didn't want to end up like Katie Mahoney. By January 1999, Trainum and Garrett finally caught a break in the case when an informant wearing a wire spoke to Cooper's alleged accomplice and barber, Ernest Burwell. The barber was already aware of the investigation and assured him that he had nothing to do with it. The barbershop guy kind of whispers to the drug dealer, look, I know Carl did it. He called me the night before and he wanted me to go along with him, but he never called me back. I said I would, but he never called me back. And then the next morning, bam, they were dead. With this information, the police had enough to arrest Ernest Burwell. The man once again denied any participation in the coffee shop homicides. Burwell told police he witnessed Cooper murder a security guard in 1993. He also agreed to wear a wire and talk to Cooper. In his second recorded conversation with Ernest Burwell, Carl Cooper told him, As my hand to God, on my father's grave, on my son's life, I had nothing to do with the Starbucks shit. He further told Burwell that it wasn't his style and that he had put his criminal life behind him. He even said he felt sorry for the victims. During the same conversation, Cooper discussed how he was agitated by police surveillance and even threatened to kill Detective Trainum and his family. It was then that the decision was made to arrest Cooper for the 1996 attempted murder of the off-duty police officer. A few days later, on March 1st, 1999, 
Agent Garrett arrested Carl Cooper outside his home. They hoped a search warrant for his house would provide the physical evidence needed to tie him directly to the coffee shop slayings. Inside Cooper's home, officers found ski masks, law enforcement clothing, and a variety of ammunition. But none of it could prove that Carl Cooper had murdered the three employees at the coffee shop. We did not have a good case on him for the coffee shop murders. But if we charged him with the racketeering in DC, then we would be under a time constraint to get him indicted and convicted. And we just didn't want to place ourselves under that constraint. So we decided that PG County had the strongest case, that they were the ones that were going to be able to hold him without letting him get out of jail, thus placing all of our other people in jeopardy. PG County detectives report that Cooper adamantly denied his involvement in both the 1996 shooting and the Starbucks murders, and even requested to take a polygraph. But after over 60 hours of interrogation, where he repeatedly waived his Miranda rights, his story started to change. A key moment came on the second day of the interrogation, when Cooper was given a computerized voice stress analysis test and showed signs of deception to questions about the Starbucks murders. Police then reminded Cooper that another one of his associates, a man named Keith Covington, knew one of the employees in the coffee shop that night, Emery Evans. Carl Cooper then made the first of three written confessions. In his first confession, he said Keith Covington had planned the robbery and he had acted only as the driver. After a short break, police bluffed and told him they found his fingerprints at the scene. Cooper then changed his story to say that he was in the Starbucks during the attempted robbery, but that Covington killed all three employees after Mary Mahoney refused to give up the keys to the safe. Keith Covington was then arrested on an outstanding warrant and questioned for 15 hours. He denied any involvement, saying he was recovering from a gunshot wound at the time. He took a polygraph test and passed it. Upon hearing of this, Carl Cooper made his third and final confession. In his final confession, he claimed total responsibility for the coffee shop killing. He said he planned and carried out the robbery after spending time casing the shop. He called his accomplice, the barber, but then decided he could handle it on his own. Didn't want to lose the window of opportunity after the shop closed and before the crew went home. He admitted to Sergeant Joseph McCann that he brought two weapons to the scene, which was his signature. Carl Cooper's uh, approach when he committed robberies was very businesslike. It was a business to him. It was not personal. And if you did exactly as he said, usually, you would make it out of there. But according to Cooper, on that night, Mary Mahoney did not comply with his request to open the safe. He said he then fired a warning shot into the ceiling, and Mahoney attempted to run into the hallway. Cooper caught her by the door and struggled with her for the key. He said she then tried to grab one of his guns and it went off. He shot her five times, shot the others, and left without taking any money. Cooper stated that he buried the two murder weapons outside St. Anne's Infant and Maternity Home just over the border in Maryland. The weapons were never recovered. On March 5, 1999, Cooper was charged with all three Starbucks murders as the lone defendant. Just over a week later, he recanted his confession, claiming he was coerced by police and that he only told them what he thought they wanted him to say. In an evidentiary hearing in federal court in January 2000, Cooper's attorney tried to have his confession thrown out on grounds that it was given under duress. The judge denied the defense motion and allowed the confession to be used, citing the fact that Cooper had voluntarily waived his Miranda rights several times. One week before his scheduled trial in April of 2000, Carl Cooper pled guilty to 47 federal charges including the Starbucks murders. By pleading guilty, Cooper avoided the death penalty. He was serving a life sentence with no possibility of parole and no appeal. Despite the confession and conviction of Carl Cooper for the murder of Mary Mahoney and her colleagues, 
Many questions about the murders remain unanswered. How was Cooper, or any perpetrator, able to gain entry to the Starbucks after closing? A witness saw the employees alive and the doors locked at 9.15, and there were no signs of forced entry. Why would Mary Mahoney risk her life to prevent the theft of $10,000 from Starbucks? Managers of shops are usually trained to comply with armed robbers and simply report the incident to police after the fact. Mary Mahoney's family and friends said she was a brave person who always did the right thing. But she was also intelligent enough to know that any reaction other than compliance would put her life at risk. Why didn't any witnesses in the busy Georgetown neighborhood hear the nine gunshots on the night of the murders? Why would an armed robber flee the scene without taking any money? Why did Carl Cooper repeatedly waive his right to an attorney and confess to a crime he swore he never committed, only to recant a week later? No audio or video recordings of Cooper's interview have ever been produced by law enforcement. Any competent attorney would have advised Cooper to exercise his Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. The DC police did not have the evidence to convict Cooper for the Starbucks murders without a confession. Why did Carl Cooper never mention slashing one of the tires on Mary Mahoney's car? Why would an armed robber feel the need to slash a car tire in the Starbucks parking lot? What did Monica Lewinsky know that made her fear for her life? Did Monica Lewinsky personally know Mary Mahoney? No concrete evidence has ever been found to support this connection, but the timing and nature of the murders have caused speculation to remain even 25 years later. 25 years ago today when three employees at a Starbucks coffee store in Georgetown were found brutally killed, shot execution style, sending shockwaves through the city with rumors of a possible connection to the Monica Lewinsky Bill Clinton sex scandal. Now that Starbucks today holding a memorial service in memory of 25 year old Emery Evans and assistant manager Mary Mahoney who were found dead alongside 18 year old Aaron Goodrick morning of July 7th of 1997. Now, assistant manager Mary Mahoney was just 16 days shy of her 25th birthday and actually was a former White House intern rumored to be that White House staffer mentioned in the Newsweek article. 29-year-old Carl Derek Havard Cooper was arrested and charged with the murders after he confessed. This was following a 54-hour interrogation by police. Cooper would later recant his confession. Now, police, however, say that the murders were committed as part of a botched robbery in which Cooper shot the three Starbucks employees after Mahoney refused to give Cooper the keys to a safe that held apparently $10,000. Now, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of a possibility, rather, of parole in the year 2000. Was the murder of Mary Mahoney the result of a robbery gone horribly wrong? Or was there some other reason she was killed? What do you think? Follow the links in the description for more information and decide for yourself. Please leave your thoughts in the comments.